Last week we looked at the aorta. I thought the obvious next thing to look at would be the veins, which are the opposite to the aorta. So, we can, so if the aorta was the big artery supplying blood to the entire body, pretty much coming out of the heart, there are in fact two veins draining blood from the body. So we have to look at the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. So when, whenever we're looking at veins, it's the opposite to arteries. So arteries we see where they go, where the flow goes. With veins we do the same, we follow the flow back. So we'll look and see how the superior vena cava is formed and how the inferior vena cava is formed. And then we'll follow them back to the heart and they both go into the right side of the heart. And then we'll look at all the other tributaries, all the other veins that drain into those veins as we go. All right? So a little bit of surface anatomy. Here's the clavicle, here's the clavicle, here's a manubrium, sternum, xiphoid process, and here is the first rib, first rib, second rib, third rib, rib, and so on. So here's the manubrio sternal angle, the angle of Louis. Now, deep to the head of the clavicle, where the clavicle meets the sternum, that is where we see, pull this off, these veins forming. So the right internal jugular vein meets the right subclavian vein and they come together to form the right brachiocephalic vein. And on the left, uh, we see the same thing happening. No, the left brachiocephalic vein is a little longer than the right because our main veins, our vena cavae, are a little bit off to the right side of our body, right? right? Um, so those two points here, roughly, are deep to the, the sternal heads, which means then that the two brachiocephalic veins are deep to the manubrium. Um, do you see manubrium here? And then the two brachiocephalic veins, they come together and they form the superior vena cava, or vena cava. Carva, that's how you pronounce the wine, isn't it? I don't know. I, I, um, so then, roughly, see where the first rib here? There's the costal cartilage of the first rib and it's joining the manubrium. Deep to that point there, that is roughly where the superior vena cava, vena cava, now I'm doing it, <laughs> starts. It's a very short blood vessel, in fact. It only goes a little way. Look, it's a few centimetres long, but it is a, it's a large blood vessel. There's the superior vena cava. There's the aorta. Um, typically, when we dissect, I would say that the aorta is, is always bigger than the superior vena cava, um, which makes sense because the aorta is taking blood out of the left side of the heart and then distributing it to the head, neck, and entire body other than the lungs. Uh, whereas the superior vena cava is draining blood, well, we can see here is draining blood from the head and the neck and the two upper limbs. It is in fact draining blood from everything superior to the diaphragm, except for the lungs, because the pulmonary arteries obviously, sorry, the pulmonary veins obviously drain blood back to the heart. And, um, and the heart veins drain back through the coronary sinus, don't they? But to all intents and purposes, all of the venous drainage of structures superior to the diaphragm drains back to the superior vena cava. All right, well, how does that work? I'm going to need another model to show that bit, actually. Okay, there's a little bit more on this one. Right, take this apart. I'm going to mix the bits up now, aren't I? Um, take the lungs out. So that we can save, take the thymus off. There we go, there's our veins. And there's the superior vena cava there. Spin this around. Now look, that's very noticeable, isn't it? So here's the superior vena cava. It's draining into the, the right atrium here. All right. So what's this blood vessel here? So we can see, look, this is on running on the posterior thoracic wall here. And we can see all of these intercostal vessels are draining into it. And then this is the airway. So this is the main bronchus dividing into lobar bronchi. And it's looping over the right main bronchus to drain back to the superior vena cava. So that is the azygos vein. Azygos comes from a word meaning 
unpaired, a zygos paired, paired, uh, a zygos unpaired, something like that anyway. Um, so we have the zygos vein is on the right side of the posterior thoracic wall, draining the blood from the intercostal arteries. And on the other side, we have the hemiozygos vein, which is actually usually in two parts. And some of that drains posteriorly behind all this stuff to drain blood to the zygos vein, and some of it drains up here to these veins up here. But nonetheless, all of the blood of the thoracic cage then is draining back to the superior vena cava, either directly through the zygos vein or indirectly through some of these other veins. All right? So that's quite a nice distinction. So the superior vena cava is a little to the right of the midline um, and it drains all the blood from this region up here. One other interesting thing about the superior vena cava is that it doesn't have any valves in it. And it doesn't have, I think the first valve is, is up here somewhere a few centimetres above um, where the internal jugular vein meets the subclavian vein. And what this means is that changes in pressure in the right atrium, as the right atrium and right side of the heart are contracting, then get reflected up um, the, the veins in this direction, because this is a low pressure system on this side, on the venous side, um, and um, the pulsations of the right atrium and the right side of the heart contracting can be seen sometimes as pulsations in the internal jugular vein up here because there's no valve to stop the blood moving up and down this column, right? So usually you'll have your patient sat up at, what, 45 degrees or so on. And this is very difficult to see. And of course, the sternocleidomastoid muscle is covering over this place here, but these are all soft tissues. So, you might see what gets called a jugular venous pulse or jugular venous pressure, which is a pulsation within the blood of the internal jugular vein, deep to the sternocleidomastoid muscle, just above the clavicle here, just a couple of centimeters above the clavicle. Very difficult to see, but an experienced cardiologist may use that to determine uh, right atrial function if they, if they suspect a problem there. Clever, huh? Um, now the inferior vena cava, is also draining to the right side of the heart. So there's the right atrium, superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, and it's a continuous tube all the way through, right? But they're both draining to the right side of the heart. Um, and look, the heart is sat right on top of the diaphragm. So as soon as the inferior vena cava passes through the diaphragm, it goes into the liver. Now we need to start at the bottom, don't we? So let's take this apart. Whoop. Oh, I can put the heart back in as well, can't I, because I've got the diaphragm. Now, what do we see? Well, we see that the inferior vena cava forms here. Um, the, vein, the big veins here on either side, these are the left and right common iliac veins. So the left and right common iliac veins come together to form the inferior vena cava. And this is, a, look, a similar level to where the aorta splits into the two common iliac arteries. And the inferior vena cava then ascends on the posterior abdominal wall and ah, it disappears here, why does it stop? Um, now what can we see as we go up? Well, we see here, here's a gonadal vein. So there's the right gonadal vein, this is a female pelvis, <laughs> just checking. Um, so this would be the ovarian vein draining blood from the ovaries. So um, the gonads, they, they start off to develop in the posterior abdominal wall in the, in the embryo, and then they descend to their final positions in the adult, and they trail their blood vessels behind them. So the right gonadal vein drains into the inferior vena cava, and it's, look, it's a, it's a lateral vein. Now, where's the left gonadal vein? Hmm, you can see the two gonadal arteries coming out of the aorta, but look, here's the gonadal vein on the left, and it's coming up here. Oh, look it's draining into the left renal vein, which is typical. So because the vena cava are shifted over to the right side of the body, the left gonadal vein drains into the left renal vein and then drains into the, into the um, inferior vena cava. This can relate to a few pathologies. So if, you know, if there is a pathology in the kidney that's pushing out through the hilum, it might affect this vein. So you might see some effects on blood flow um, from the, the left gonad. Um, I imagine you might not see much in the female pelvis, but in, in the male pelvis you may see some you know, fluid collecting in the scrotum and that sort of thing, right? If this gonadal vein is, is constricted. There's, there's something called nutcracker syndrome as well, where the superior 
mesenteric artery here overlies the renal vein. So if we get some pathology there and it starts to squash the left renal vein, then it impairs blood flow back, not just from the left kidney, but also from the, the left testicle. Um, and then you start to get uh, varicocele, you start to get swelling of the veins um, in, the, in the scrotum, right? So pathology up here causes signs down here. In the male pelvis, this is a female pelvis. Anyway, so that's the other thing then is we see these large vessels here. These are the left and right renal veins draining blood from the kidneys back to the inferior vena cava. Again, the kidneys are processing a lot of blood, which is why their blood vessels are so large. Now, the other thing we have, we can see it, is we have the suprarenal veins, um, the adrenal, suprarenal veins, the suprarenal glands, or veins on the brain, um, or adrenal glands, and these are on top of, they're superior to the kidneys, and their suprarenal veins, they have got a lot of veins, They'll, most of them will probably drain to the, um, to the renal veins, but look on the on the right side, the suprarenal vein is very close to the inferior vena cava, so it's likely that suprarenal veins on the right side are going to drain to the, the um, inferior vena cava. You know, there's going to be a bit of variety here. Veins, veins tend to be more varied than arteries when we look at them throughout the body. Um, the other thing we can see are look, these little guys. Remember we had lumbar branches from the aorta. Um, we also have then lumbar veins draining similar tissues, all these this is the post these are the these are the segmental analogues of the intercostal veins up in the thorax right so you know you've got intercostal veins running around the rib you've got those same segments down here so these lumbar veins are you know draining the body wall in this region so those go back to the inferior vena cava as well so why does it end here well also not only why does it end there but in the aorta we look at three major branches that supply blood to the gi tract where are those veins on the inferior vena cava? Where does the blood from the GI tract go to? I don't see any of these veins here on the inferior vena cava, so what's going on? Where does the blood, where does all the blood from the GI tract go to? Goes to the liver, doesn't it? So the liver processes all the stuff that's being digested in the digestive tract. That's one of its 500 odd functions. And that's why it's missing from this model is because the the liver wraps around the inferior vena cava. So when we took the liver out on this model, we took the inferior vena cava with it, the last part of it. Um, so that's that bit there. See, the liver is, is tightly surrounding the inferior vena cava. Now, what happens is, is the blood from the GI tract goes to the portal vein, the portal vein goes into the liver, liver processes all that stuff, and then we have um, hepatic veins draining from the liver directly back into the inferior vena cava. There are three. So this is a liver from another model. This is a model that the inferior vena cava stayed in the model. So the, the inferior vena cava has gone, but we can see three hepatic veins here draining from the liver into the inferior vena cava. In the embryo, um, there's also a ductus venosus around here. So the ductus venosus is similar to the ductus arteriosus we saw when we looked at the aorta. And the ductus venosus allows about half of the blood coming back from the placenta, so this is oxygen-rich, nutrient-rich blood, to bypass the liver and go straight into the inferior vena cava and then up. Um, so we often see that as a remnant on the liver, but that's more of a liver topic. Go and have a look at the liver video for that. Um, but that one doesn't fit. I have two livers. But, um, and then that's it. So the inferior vena cava passes up and goes into the heart. Um, one other set of blood vessels that I can think of, um, when we looked at the aorta, we talked about blood vessels supplying blood to the diaphragm, and those were the phrenic arteries. So we have phrenic veins also draining blood from the diaphragm. The superior phrenic veins aren't really talked about much. There are some inferior phrenic veins, inferior to the diaphragm, and those, there are a few of those, and the ones towards the right side drain to the um, inferior vena cava, the ones to the left side, I think, take alternate routes. But this, you know, we don't talk about the, the phrenic veins as much as we do the phrenic arteries. Anywho, so that's it. Um, the inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava. So then the inferior vena cava is draining blood from everything inferior to the diaphragm. One caveat to that is that 
these lumbar veins are actually all linked together and they do link to the hemizygous and zygous veins. So there is a possibility of flow between the thoracic and abdominal compartments. But that's how we describe it. So that's how blood gets back to the heart. Um, remember that even though these are large veins, they are quite different to the, to the large arteries. Um, they are not muscular walled, they're not elastically walled, so they're, they're much easier to compress, they're much easier to dilate. Um, in terms of pathology, they tend to get affected by um, compression from other structures nearby, you know, uh, masses, tumours, that sort of thing. Um, but none of the pathology that we were really talking about when we were talking about the aorta. Nonetheless, if the, if the vena cavae fail, it is again catastrophic just because of the sheer volume of blood that they carry. Okay, the superior and inferior vena cavae. Superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, their anatomy. Ah, nice and straightforward that one, wasn't it? Right, good. See you next week.